talk about what are some of the uh, considerations for choosing a vehicle to convert. You know, it's interesting talking to people in the live uh, workshops. Most people get here, they have an idea of what vehicle they want to do. They either already own it or they've got one in mind. Very few people haven't really decided yet. And so we go through this exercise anyway because not all vehicles are created the same in regards to their suitability, let's say, for being converted to electric. These are the things that we're going to talk about in regards to a vehicle to convert. Weight is a huge factor and we're going to talk about it and we'll talk about it quite a bit throughout the workshop as a matter of fact, but weight affects your range, it affects your cost, it affects your performance. Weight is a huge factor, that's why I list it number one. Number two is coefficient of drag, and we're gonna discuss that, look at some examples. If you're only gonna drive your vehicle around town under 45 miles an hour, uh, the drag coefficient isn't really a big deal, but if you're gonna use the car as a commuter vehicle on the freeway, drag coefficient is gonna be a, a decision fact. Rolling resistance, huge. It's amazing what just low rolling resistance tires can do. Uh, just on the shop floor, moving things around. It's always been amazing to me how much a difference just the tires will make. And of course, all wheel drive, four wheel drive, drivetrain things can affect that. The disc brakes actually have greater rolling resistance than drum brakes because drum brakes, you can adjust any resistance out of it. Disc brakes always have some drag. I'm not telling you not to use disc brakes, I'm just for instance. And then uh, a manual transmission. We'll talk more about the transmissions as we go along of course you can use an automatic and you can remove the transmission altogether the size of the car you know uh, people think smaller would be better it's gonna be lighter gonna have possibly less drag coefficient you'll see that size has some issue the relationship to cost speed and range that's the balancing act that we have to do as a converter is we're always balancing at least those three things and then we're going to talk about how accessories can also affect your decision if you're wanting to build a vehicle on a budget, and people ask me all the time, why are the early Porsches and classic VWs so popular? Right there. They don't have power brakes, they don't have power steering, and they typically don't have air conditioning. All of those things add to the cost and can add thousands of dollars to the cost. And then uh, accessibility. When we convert this vehicle, are these is there room uh, back up to the size there? Is the space such that allows for accessibility to the components? You don't want to have to be stashing something in a little spot that you can never get to again once you add other components. That's not, not a wise path to go down. I don't recommend purchasing a vehicle that doesn't run. I mean, if it's a vehicle that you've owned, you know the condition it was in before it quit running, that's one thing. But if you're buying a vehicle that's new to you and it doesn't run, doesn't have an engine or whatever, the engine doesn't run, whatever the case may be, buying that vehicle, you may save money because, hey, they're selling a vehicle that doesn't run, that devalues it. But it also makes for a huge unknown. What's the condition of the steering, the brakes, the transmission? the differential, the, all the running gear, all those things are not testable. You're not able to test them and know whether or not they work as they should. And so you really don't know how much you're biting off as far as the work goes and price. So you may not be saving money. And I talk to many people that have gone that route and save money apparently up front, but when all was said and done, they spent a lot more than if they bought one with an existing running uh, power plant. The other is you can sell the engine. You, know? uh, you can sell a running engine for a lot Lot more than you can one that doesn't run and so we always video the engines running and it helps them sell we've never had a problem getting rid of an engine value proposition there's a reason you don't see a lot of people converting you know a Toyota Camry some other cars is that by the time you purchase the car or if you already have the cost of conversion and the value of the car when it's all said and done probably not the best choice from a financial standpoint but a classic VW a Porsche and most other classic cars they have an innate value that by converting it to electric, you're typically not taking away any of that value. And in a lot of cases, you're adding value to it. There's one more thing that I think is important, and that is fun to drive. You know, for over seven years, I drove a 1974 Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Being electric, it didn't have all the high maintenance issues that a gasoline-powered Carmen Ghia has. No oil changes, no valve adjustments, nothing. And it outperformed it, hands down. We tested on the racetrack, it outperformed it. As far as handling, acceleration, whole kit and caboodle. Put four-wheel disc brakes on it, which meant now we don't have any maintenance of the brakes. The uh, the classic VW Beetles, Carmen Gears, the later Carmen Gears had front disc brakes, but 
you still had rear drum brakes and the VW drum brakes weren't self-adjusting. So that was a maintenance thing that hit away from, which to me just made it much more fun to drive. Being able to turn the key and go, that's fun. We're gonna talk about automobile, automobile drag coefficient. And you can see that this, this uh, PowerPoint was set up for the live version, but we're gonna talk about what affects drag. First of all, we probably should, what is drag coefficient? Well, it's just the, uh, the resistance that the air provides as the car is passing through the air. When we're looking at the numbers, the lower the number, the better, because that means the less drag. Greater the drag, the more energy you're gonna to use to go any given distance. So we want a low drag coefficient. What are some of the things, there's lots of things to affect it, but some of the main things that affect aerodynamic drag, the frontal area. The other is weight, and that's the area behind the vehicle, the turbulence that's created behind the vehicle from the air coming around the vehicle. Skin friction is another one. Under body flow, that's why most of your new cars now have these panels underneath to clean up the flow of air underneath the car, keep it going through instead of it getting broken up and being turbulent underneath there. It's one of the reasons why air dams, spoilers down low on a car. It's why cars typically get better mileage than say a pickup truck or an SUV that sits higher and has more uh, turbulent under body flow. And the thing to remember is that the drag force increases with the square of speed. So if you double the speed, you're going to have four times the drag. That's why a lot of cars can get up to 100 miles an hour, but very few cars can get up to 200 miles because from 100 to 200 miles an hour, you're doubling the speed, but the drag is going to be four times as great. So let's look at some examples of vehicle drag coefficient. Now you can look up your particular car on the internet. All this information is available. Just want to give you a few examples. And so the Volkswagen Westphalia campers, one of the worst, terrible frontage area. They sit up high, so they got, you know, turbulent, they get a, you know, flat back end, so they got a terrible wake issue. They're just terrible when it comes to the uh, coefficient of drag. And so you can see it's got a high number, a 0.51. My Volkswagen e-Golf has a 0.281. Classic VW Beetle, 0.48. If we're in a very aerodynamic vehicle. Uh, a Mazda Miata, here it is. Boy, you look frontal area on those things. They're a small car and you'd think it'd be less, but you know, again, convertibles, if the top is down especially, you know, but even with the top up, they've got that skin friction we were talking about. So typically uh, convertibles don't do very well in the uh, in the wind tunnel. And so uh, the smart car, another little tiny car, they get that blunt back in so forth, uh, same as a Miata. The, the original Tesla Roadster didn't fare too well either, 0.35. And that's because it was originally a race car. It was a Lotus Elise, or it was based on the Elise. I mean, it wasn't exact, but there was a downforce designed into that car. Most race cars or cars that are designed for higher speeds have downforce designed in, and that's to keep the car on the road. It's not a big issue for them because they usually have high horsepower they can overcome that, that those two work together. That high horsepower makes it go fast. They have to have the downforce when it goes fast to keep it on the, on the road. And so you can see the McLaren F1, 0.32. Honda Insight, which is a hybrid. And of course, you know, beauties in the eye of the beholder. I think they're kind of funky looking. They have the fender skirts, all that. It has the same drag coefficient as the McLaren. And then you look at the Scion Xbox. You know, here's a shoebox running down the road and you can see, and it, it has a better drag coefficient than a Beetle or a Miata. Let's look at a few more. Toyota Prius, hybrid, modern car. You think, oh wow, it's a 0.29 which is the exact same as a 1984 Pontiac Trans Am. If you look at the two cars side by side, who would guess that they have the same? Who's gonna look at a McLaren F1 and the Xbox and say they've got the same track? And that's why I bring all this up. That's why I show you these examples. You can't tell by looking at the car. Look it up on the internet, find out for sure if your car uh, that you're thinking about doing has a good drag coefficient or not. Nissan Leaf, which is an electric vehicle, the Volkswagen E-Golf, which is an all electric vehicle, they're both 2.8, but look up the uh, 1948 Tucker Torpedo. Big car, had less drag than these modern electric vehicles. And then of course, the uh, Tesla Model S, which was designed from the ground up to be an electric car, to be an efficient car, and it only has a 0.24 drag coefficient. That's one of the reasons large battery packs and their low drag, their low rolling resistance, all these things allow those cars to get the range that they get. And then the one that beats all of them is the uh, EV one from 1996. That's the car that 
was featured in the movie Who Killed the Electric Car. GM crushed all of those, but a handful of them. Just think what a head start they had. I mean, it wasn't the best looking car in my opinion, but it wasn't hideous either. But look at that drag coefficient, beautiful. They were so far ahead of everybody else. They were here first, they had a head start, they blew it. A little more example here, it's a real world example. In 1970, Plymouth wanted to race at NASCAR and in order to take car and to be able to compete using you know the existing production vehicle and so forth, they figured that to compete, they needed at least another 200 horsepower over what the car already had in it. And that's a huge undertaking. Any of you that are familiar with engines and racing and so forth, you know to crank out extra horsepower, especially extra 200 horsepower, that's no small endeavor. To build a, a, a more powerful engine, get another 200 horsepower, that's going to be some big dollars also. Instead, what they did was they lowered the drag coefficient. So the 1970 Roadrunner had a drag coefficient of 0.38. And by adding a nose cone and a wing, they came up with a car that then labeled the Superbird with a drag coefficient at 2.8. It was equivalent to adding 200 horsepower. So when I tell you it's important to consider the drag coefficient, I think this is a pretty good example.